This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices, episode 275, was recorded on June 10th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by farmtogether.com, bringing farmland a new trillion-dollar investment opportunity within reach of all accredited investors. Professor Steve Keen returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss why Steve says inflation is definitely coming, but it won't be the runaway inflation feared by many people, myself included, nor will it be the hyperinflation that some folks fear, myself not included. Steve says the inflation is inevitable, but it doesn't pose a great threat, and he rejects my own suggestion that an Austrian crack-up boom has already begun. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview, when Patrick and I will take a quick look at yields in the bond market. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, let's talk S&P 500. I mean, just keeps crawling higher, but it's been so trade range bound. I mean, we had almost three or four closes in a row that were within a point of each other. It doesn't seem like the market has any momentum to want to go anywhere. What's your take on all of this? Well, honestly, Patrick, the, the notion that the market has no momentum to go anywhere because we haven't had a new all-time high in like almost three weeks now, um, I think means that we've gotten to the point where this market is pretty darn complacent. Uh, I think the arguments that this market is just so overvalued and this has to end badly are very well placed. But, you know, I figured out that end badly doesn't have to mean down. It can mean an Austrian crack up boom. And that's exactly what I think is happening. Well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index, which, uh, again, has been pinned along that five-year low, trading in that uh, 89 to 90 range on the dollar index. Uh, What's uh, your view on the dollar? Has it changed much from last week? Patrick, no real change. We're in a situation where until we get a close below 89, there's really no bearish indication. And frankly, it would take a lot to get a solid bullish indication here. No no real change. And, And frankly, no conviction as to where it's headed next. Well, let's talk crude oil, because uh, obviously over the last couple of weeks, uh, the crude oil has been incredibly strong. Then we saw a quick nosedive this morning on the downside of oil, and just as quickly it reversed and uh, is back up toward the 52-week high. Uh, What the heck happened? Well, this was another case of Twitter having more influence on the price of financial assets than actual reality. What really happened is the United States relaxed sanctions on one individual in Iran, an oil-related official. Uh, It had nothing to do with the negotiations or any of that stuff. It was just a kind of a matter of fact that, you know, the the thing had expired or something. It was time to uh, take the sanctions off of one person whose sanctions were expiring. And that tweet got misinterpreted because of the way somebody worded it as the United States has lifted all sanctions on Iranian oil, which is not what happened. So the market started to crash and then it retraced very quickly. I think today was a gift to oil traders, Patrick, because frankly, in reality, the fact that the Iranian sanctions are going to be lifted is already priced into the long term futures. It's already there. Everybody knows it's coming. What the market taught us today, though, is that when that real announcement happens, and it really is, the sanctions have been lifted because the Biden administration is going to undo everything it possibly can that the Trump administration did. Well, what's the result going to be? We saw it today. The market's going to crash, and that's going to be an incredible buyable dip opportunity. So I am waiting for that one with bated breath, Patrick. When Iran sanctions are lifted, which I do think is coming, it's going to be a huge panic, and it's going to be over nothing. It doesn't mean anything as far as I'm concerned in the overall course of this bull market, but it will be a buying opportunity. Eric, how did uh, the inventory numbers come in this week? 
Crude oil drew down 5.2 million barrels, or 6.6 million if you include the SPR. Now, that would normally be a pretty significant drawdown for crude oil. The thing is, there were much larger builds in finished products. Gasoline building 7 million barrels, distillates building 4.4 million barrels. So you got you know almost a 5 million barrel net build on petroleum products, both crude oil and finished products. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 165,000 barrels. U.S. production, 11,000 even. That's back up 200,000 barrels from last week. All right, well, let's move on to gold because uh, gold has, um, over the last two weeks, uh, had two quick little dips, each time reversing pretty quickly right back toward the highs. We're trading right near 1,900 at the time of recording. What's your take on gold here? Well, Patrick, we got the test of the 200-day moving average that we predicted last week. Happened, I think, in the overnight, right after our show went live last week. And it's recovered back up above the short-term moving averages. So we've got the completion almost of this technical pattern. We went nice breakout above the 200-day. We got up to, what was it, 1918, just almost 1920. And then we went back down and tested that 200-day as support. Check, that's the next thing. Now there's only one more hurdle to clear, and that's a daily close above the previous high at 1920, and we're only about 20 bucks away from it. I definitely think there's lots more upside to come in this gold market, and we've just seen, so far at least, what I think is kind of a perfect completion of that technical pattern. You know, breakout, uh, drift down perfectly almost to the tick, testing that 200-day simple moving average, and then rallying off of it. Uh, you're the technician in the house, Patrick. How do you see this market? Well, I mean, gold has continued to uh, be well accumulated. All dips are being bought very quickly. The price action remains structurally bullish, and, and we're seeing both real and, uh, and nominal yields backing off, which is acting a bit as a tailwind. So right now, gold continues to behave very well. Now, but let's uh, move to that 10-year Treasury yield, because uh, just like I was saying there, we have quite the break uh, on the downside of uh, rates as we're uh, now trading around the one spot four six five. Uh, level on the 10-year Treasury yield. I have some charts I want to talk about this uh, in the post game, but what's your take on this? Well, Patrick, I think it is significant that we're back below 1.5% on the 10-year. Let's wait for the post game chart deck where we can take a look and discuss this in more detail. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Professor Steve Keen. Eric, it's been a while. Why did we get Steve back on the show? Well, Patrick, as you know, the big question that's really on my mind is, are we on the cusp or perhaps already beyond the beginning of a shift to a new secular inflation, like in 1960, late 60s, uh, 1970s kind of inflation, really big one? I think we are. And the thing is, I've heard people who agree with me. I've heard people who disagree with me, who kind of hold my same mindset that that inflation would be a, a horrible thing. So I wanted to talk to someone on the opposite side of this ideological divide in terms of what the role of central banks should be and what monetary policy should be and so forth. I think we're headed toward a political regime where people like Steve Keen and people who have Steve's political ideology are going to be in charge of making the decisions for the major institutions. So even though I don't happen to personally agree, I don't want to know what people like I think. I want to know what the people who are going to be in charge of pulling the levers think. And I think it's guys that think more like Steve than think like me who are coming into power. So I wanted to get Steve's perspective just for that reason. Eric's interview with Professor Steve Keen is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Michelle Dennity's five-part series about the role of digital innovation in advancing the ESG economy is live now at smartermarketspod.com and you can look for another terrific interview every Saturday morning. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app in order to listen to this free podcast. (music) 
And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Professor Steve Keen, formerly a professor from a university in London, now professor at large, teaching economics on the internet via Patreon. Steve, it's been way too long. It's great to have you back on the show, but you know, you have been one of the most outspoken guys talking about why too much debt really leads to a macroeconomic prognostication or diagnosis or, or uh, forecast, whatever you want to call it, of ongoing deflation. My big question to you is, boy, it seems to me like the politics have changed and we maybe are back to the late 1960s and facing an incipient, not just little whiff of inflation, but I think secular shift to a really big inflation that's going to be a big deal. Um, am I crazy? What do you think? Well, we've certainly got a, a, a shock coming through from the supply side of things. I mean, COVID's obviously disturbed global production chains around the planet. We're seeing signs of that as well with climate change, with Taiwan uh, running out of water and therefore not be able to supply the chips of the world. So you've got an increase in you know, the essential, highly uh, transform manufacturing input. And you have a range of uh, other commodities. I believe copper and nickel, the two that are... are are showing signs of uh, supply disruptions. So all this stuff is meaning you're going to get a supply kick, a uh, cost of production kick coming through, which you could actually liken to what happened back in 1973, 74 with the Yom Kippur War, the OPEC blockade, and the increase in oil prices from $2.50 a barrel to 10 and then the same in 1979-80 when they went from $10 to 40 So that's, they're definitely there's a, there's a price hit coming through from the supply side of the economy. But what is different this time around is that when that happened in the 70s, you had an absolute mother of all booms on, which was credit financed. And uh, you also had uh, unemployment so low. I mean, it was, in terms of recorded level in America, it was running at about uh, of the order of 4%, 3 to 4%, which is comparable to what they're calling the unemployment numbers these days. But frankly, the numbers were more honest back then. There was, there's been so much hiding of unemployment in the uh, and in not looking for work uh, section of the statistics that I don't try, I, I think you've pretty much got to double the unemployment rate there so to make it comparable to what was actually being properly recorded back in the 70s. But with the very tight labour market and the booming credit conditions in the 70s, that meant that that supply shock was passed on to prices. So you had, and this is where endogenous money thinking comes in, you had a huge increase in the price of, uh, of, of uh, particularly of obviously oil. That was then covered by firms accessing their lines of credit to pay for it, which gave a stimulus courtesy of the cost boost into the economy as well. Workers, uh, particularly when you had trade unions, which had been decimated in the last 40, 40 years, 40 to 50 years, uh, they could bargain for higher wages as well. So you got a, a flow on from the supply shock of the increase in the oil prices to an increase in wages. And you then had this income distributional battle, the, the wage price spiral, which went on for a while until it was crushed by the massive increase in interest rates under Vocla. Now, you don't have anything like the credit demand anymore, nor do you have the bargaining power of the working class. Uh, they've been destroyed. They were, they were bad enough in the 70s in terms of political power in America. They've been crushed in the last 40 years. So I don't think you're going to see the aggregate demand follow through to that supply shock. So I expect an increase in prices, quite a sharp one, in particularly in, in you know, raw material prices and also CPUs. But then that will peter out because the demand won't be there. So I see the, the price hit leading to a decline in the numbers being sold rather than an increase in the money being, being borrowed to purchase those and keeping the price momentum going. So if you, if, if you look back at the, uh, the 1970s and take a look at the, what the unemployment rate was before the, the crunch began in the, uh, the oil price rise, in 1972 you had an unemployment rate of, uh, of 6%, which fell to 4.6. That's, that's a genuine recording of the unemployment rate. And at the same time, credit was running at about 11 and a half, 12% of GDP, which is quite high. It's only been higher three times, four times, pardon me, the fourth time being the beginning of the 2007 crash. Now, when you, when you think of it from the point of view of, of capitalists and investors, when you have a huge increase 
in, in wage costs and, and raw materials, you have a drop in your profit margin. So the credit demand plunged from that point. It went from 12% of GDP down to 5.5%. And that's when you had the huge rise in unemployment at that stage. And you had, a, a both de- you had inflation and unemployment. I think you're going to have not a, not a large downturn, but I just don't think the kick to inflation is going to be there. Steve, talk to me about the relationship between inflation and bond rates, because I'm noticing a lot of investors acting as if inflation caused bond rates to increase. And and I would argue it doesn't work that way. Inflation sometimes inspires central bankers to take actions which cause bond yields to increase. But I don't think the inflation is causing it. I think it's the inflation is inspiring the central bankers to make policy actions that do it. How is this relationship, how does it really work between inflation and bond yields? Well, the point which um, endogenous money theory and, and modern monetary theory as well, and this is stuff which you find central banks confirming these days rather than denying, points out is that the, the central bank can set any rate of interest it likes fundamentally. It's, it's the controller of the base rate of interest. It can't control the far end. It can't control long rates. But at the short rate end, it basically sets the price. And therefore, it's determining. It's not a market-driven system. It's the decisions of the central bank as to what that short-term rate could be. And we saw Vokler putting it up, you know, from what, 8% to 8 for 17% as a policy move to try to suppress the inflation back in the, uh, the late 70s, early 80s. So it's, it's a policy instrument at the short end, it's more market driven at the long end. But overall, in terms of sh- certainly short term bond yields, if the central bank doesn't think the inflation that they're seeing is sustained, then they won't be putting up their short term rates and you won't see a follow through from inflation to interest rates. How would you interpret what's happened so far to the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield? Because it seemed at first like people were really freaking out and and afraid that it was running away. And somehow we hit about 1.75, and all of a sudden it seems to have just settled down. Are are we done, or are we just pausing before moving higher? I I just can't see it moving higher because... I mean, the, the, the bond rates, if you're talking government bonds, and government can pay effectively any rate, rate it wants to pay on the, on the bonds. If it issues its own currency, it's, you know, in effect, it can, the Treasury can borrow from the central bank and pay zero interest on that borrowing to pay the interest they then pass on to bondholders. So there's no mechanism to force the government's hand in that sense. And when you look at the, the level of, of debt that the private sector is carrying, there's no way I think the private sector can handle an interest rate even you know one percent higher than things are right now because the corporate sector in America right now is carrying the highest level of, of private debt compared to GDP in its history. Uh, that's that's been co-driven by COVID, of course, a giant spike in the in the, uh, uh, the level of private debt for corporations, which I think I would I would expect it was being caused by having to you know access lines of credit and uh, overdrafts to cope with the low cut of cash flow for, from COVID. So just to give you those numbers, the uh, corporate sector's corporate sector private debt, uh, debt to GDP ratio when 2020 began was 75% of GDP. By September, it was 84% of GDP. That's a t- almost a 10% jump in nine months. So that is not a corporate sector that can handle a large cost increase in its interest rate costs. So I just don't think we've got momentum for interest rates to go much higher. Steve, let's come to the subject of modern monetary theory. You have expressed uh, what I would describe as a proponent position. You like this idea of MMT. I personally have concerns with it, but I'll tell you, I'm convinced of one thing, which is whether I like it or not, it's happening. You've been following this for quite a while. How do you see what I think is really a a political power change? All of a sudden, the people who are in power are very friendly to what I would describe as maybe your monetary politics as opposed to my monetary politics. Now that uh, your team's kind of got the power, how do you see this going down? What happens in terms of how these MMT concepts are adopted now that the people who have been supporting them seem to be in power? Well, it's it's not so much people who support uh, a policy as as saying that what MMT shows is, is simply using accounting to say what are the consequences of government debt, what are the consequences of government uh, spending and borrowing, and so on. And it's realism about that versus uh, you know we're we're all going to be ruined stuff. If you read the macro textbooks of the mainstream, people like Gregory Mankiw will argue that government debt 
Uh, first of all, uh, if the government borrows money, or if the, if the government uh, increases its issues of bonds, which is what it actually does, then that is going to take money out of the private sector. So more government borrowing reduces the amount of money for private investment. That's literally out of Mancu's textbook. And I think most a lot of people listening to what we're talking about now would say, yeah, that's what I learned. That's that's true. And then also saying that it's this this spending, a large amount of spending and a high level of government debt puts an unconscionable burden on future generations, which you'll also find in Mancu and all the usual neoclassical textbooks. Now, from an accounting point of view, that is just wrong. Okay, I've forgotten um, uh, Paul Krugman's use, uh, favorite way of putting it, but it is just simply a fallacy when you look at the accounting, and that's what MMT is based upon. It's saying let's look at the actual cash flows that are involved. Where does the money come from, and where does the money go to when the government borrows, and what what, what actually happens when a deficit is run? Now, you read the economic textbooks; the deficit uh, takes loanable funds away from the private sector and therefore reduces the rate of investment of the private sector and causes the economy to slow down uh, while government spending boosts other parts of the economy. That's the way that the textbooks talk about it. But if you look at what actually is involved in, in banking, and of course the last people you should ask about what banks do are pri- a, a conventional economists because they haven't got a bloody clue. They've lived with a set of models, uh, the mon- money multiplier, fractional reserve banking, and loanable funds, all of which are fallacies. And finally, I think, I think I've said this numerous times, the Bank of England and the Bundesbank have both come out and said, these are simply fallacies. That is not how banks operate. In the banking sector, the, the point of what the banks do is rather than banks lending out deposits, bank lending creates deposits. So that's a complete change in how we think about the private credit system. Now, what MMT is doing, and it's complementary to what I do in terms of analysing credit, is saying, well, let's do the same thing with looking at what the government does. So what happens when the government runs a deficit? Is, is, is it borrowing money from the private sector that the private sector would otherwise spend, which is what neoclassical economics teaches you? No, it's not. When the government spends more than it taxes, it increases the amount of money in private bank accounts. To do that, it also has to increase the amount of money in, pri- in bank accounts, private bank accounts at the central bank. So the, the, the act of in putting money in your, your deposit account, if you've got a, you know, a, a COVID check from the, the, the Biden administration or even the Trump administration when it existed, uh, that, in, that you know, say $600 check uh, to you would be matched by a $600 increase in the reserves of the private banks that you bank with. Otherwise, their assets and liabilities would be unbalanced. So that's simply accounting. Now, when you look at that, you see, okay, the the deficit has created money. So you, you as a private banking account holder and the private banking system in general, you have more money in your your bank account when the government runs a deficit. Now, how does the how are the bonds bought? What happens with the bond buying? Well, just when because the increase in deposits of the banks caused by deficit spending is matched by an increase in the reserves of the banks, the private banks at the central bank by the same act, those private central private banks now have excess reserves, which normally earn them no interest. So when the government, the treasury then says, we're going to issue bonds or sell bonds to the private banking sector to cover the, the size of the deficit, those bonds are purchased using the excess reserves created by the deficit. Now, there's all sorts of timing issues involved and the government can be estimating ahead of schedule what it expects to do and sell the bonds before it does the, does the spending and so on, yada, yada, yada. But fundamentally, the deficit creates the money in the private bank accounts and it creates the excess reserves that are used to purchase those bonds by the banking sector. So there is no problem. First of all, there's no problem about burdening future generations. In fact, you're enriching current ones, at least monetarily, because they're going to have more money in their bank accounts. And the debt that is created, which is is bonds, is simply changing non-income earning reserves for the banking sector to income earning bonds for the banking sector. So all the scare stories that are a common part of saying we've got to control the deficit, et cetera, et cetera, are simply scare stories. They're not accurate as an accounting vision of a monetary economy. Steve, you've emphasized very strongly over the years that the number one biggest problem we face is too much private debt. I I wonder, uh, obviously, MMT by its definition involves more public debt because that's kind of what it is, is a a prescription of using public debt in order to uh, accomplish public spending more effectively. It seems to me that there is an extension of that, that MMT policies – 
really tend to also encourage more private borrowing and more private debt accumulation, which seems to me adds to the problems you're talking about. Would you disagree with that? Or is it just a question of needing to separate those that, yeah, we, we do need MMT. We just need to be careful. Yeah, I think we need to separate them because, like, and this is like MMT is is a is a, as I say they call it modern monetary theory because it's a modern development. You can trace it back to the 1990s, initially with Warren Mosler talking about how governments don't spend to tax the tax to spend they spend to tax. And equally, my work on credit is a modern innovation. I began doing that in the 90s with my models of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and I've only recently built a sort of general theoretical explanation for how credit adds to aggregate demand. So they are two new elements. Now, MMT, uh, from what I can see of what most of the authors have written MMT, haven't yet got their heads around the role of credit properly. Now, that's, that doesn't apply to, say, Stephanie Kelton, for example. As Stephanie's, I mean, if you read between the lines in her book, The Deficit Myth, you can see awareness of the role of credit there, but the focus is still on government spending. But there was a debate uh, not a debate, a slanging match, really, between um, Randy Ray and Doug, I think it's Doug Henwood. Doug Henwood put out an attack on elements of MMT. And as part of that, he said that the strange thing to him was that there's no role for credit and what he sees in MMT. And Randy Ray's reply said that, well, uh, you know, overall, we, we regard, he regarded the endogenous money revolution where people like myself developed an analysis of the role of credit how banks create money by lending rather than banks lending out deposits. He said the impact of that was quote unquote trivial because what it, all it did was say that rather than the government controlling the quantity of money, it controls the price of money and, uh, and the market sets the quantity. That is incomplete. Okay, When you have a new set of ideas like MMT on one hand and my analysis of credit on the other, it takes time for people to put them together. So I believe that they are compatible. And then when they are compatible, it means you have to worry about there being too much private debt. If MMT, you should be focusing on reducing the level of private debt, uh, as well as saying there should be more fiat money creation and less credit money creation. So it's possible to combine the two together, but that hasn't actually intellectually happened yet. I hope it'll happen in the next couple of years. So they're not incompatible per se. They're not like Austrian versus post-Keynesian economics or anything like that, or Austrian versus Marxian, heaven forbid. Uh, they're compatible, but they haven't yet been combined. Steve, when we've spoken in the past, uh, at least in my perception, uh, I would summarize what you've said is, look, we've got such a problem with private debt that if this goes too much farther, we're eventually going to get to the point where it's not just that maybe we might have to go to a debt jubilee someday, but eventually you get to the point where there's kind of a point of no return where there's no other option. Are we there yet? Or, or is this a zombie economy that, that is facing a, a debt jubilee someday that's unavoidable? Or is there still a way to avoid that? The way to avoid it is by continuing being stupid. And I, you know, as, as Einstein used to say that the, the two things that are limitless are the universe and human stupidity. He wasn't sure about the universe, but he was sure about human stupidity. I've got to agree with him, I'm afraid, on that front. Uh, but yes, I do think that we've reached a point of no return because, again, if I look at this just in terms of the history of America and say what's the level of private debt now versus its previous peaks, the current level of private debt, again, courtesy of COVID, is about 160% of GDP. It peaked at 170% back in the financial crisis in 2009. The highest before that was 130% during the Great Depression. And then you go back to 70% in the 1910s. Uh, America is at its absolute ceiling in terms of its capacity to carry private debt given the other dynamics of the economy. Other countries have had high levels, but they're all carrying peak debt, certainly in comparison to any time since the end of the Second World War. So we, what that means is with so much private debt accumulated, the potential for any credit-driven demand is minor. But a, a healthy capitalist economy does function better if you have credit demand, particularly if it goes to entrepreneurs to enable innovation to take place. So you have something which is cutting off the potential for innovation, which is the, the, the thing which gives capitalism a reason to crow about itself as a social system versus any other. So we have so much private debt accumulated, so much inability of both banks to extend further credit and borrowers and individuals to take on that credit, that you have credit stagnation. And and, and also, it means people spend the money they have in their pockets more slowly. 
you have a lower velocity of money because you want to hang on to the money you've got to pay the debt you've got, but by hanging onto the money, you don't spend it, and therefore the turnover is lower, and you get very low bang for your buck out of, out of the uh, the green back in your pocket. So there's all sorts of reasons why we face permanent stagnation unless we reduce the level of private debt. And COVID has come through on top of that, and I think climate change will come on later and just mean that unless you reduce the level of private debt, you're going to have mass bankruptcies. Steve, a few years ago, you wrote a book called Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? And when we talked about that at the time, you know, I was thinking financial crisis, that means stock market crash. I'm starting to think the next financial crisis that the economy faces is more likely to be uh, an inflation, a runaway inflation, where if anything, what you're worried about is an upside risk to the stock market as opposed to a downside risk. And the risks that you get concerned with are not stock market crash. They're completely different. Uh, that probably is very much at odds with the deflationary conclusion that you, at least in the past, have drawn from this excessive overhang of debt. So how does this work? Do we need to be worried about a financial crisis that's more of like a crack up boom, a runaway inflation? Or is that not really in the cards? I can't see runaway inflation just because I can't see runaway aggregate demand. And that's what you need to have a, a supply shock like we've got in coming through because of the uh, COVID supply chain disruptions and and mineral shortages as well coming out. And I like, like even hardwood in America, apparently, there's a shortage there at the moment. But to have that turn into a sustained inflation, you've got to have it being something that then leads to wage rises, which then lead back to more uh, price increases and more wage rises and so on. And you simply don't have the bargaining capacity in the working class in America anymore to enable that to happen, nor do you have the credit-based demand that used to exist, which could mean that uh, companies would absorb a price rise by borrowing, you know, extending their lines of credit and their overdrafts and therefore keep the momentum going at the price cost increase through the price system. So I can't see that happening. What, what I can see are massively overvalued stock markets courtesy of Federal Reserve intervention. And to me, that's given you a fragility in the financial sector, which just basically requires good news to happen all the time to avoid a downturn. Now, of course, the Fed can dive back in and rescue those markets anytime it likes, so long as those crises don't look like they're existential. But I overall just can't see a stagflation. I can see a stock market crash and the Fed diving back in to rescue the markets again, which is what it's been doing ever since 2010. But it's, it's not something I'd be trying to explain in the 1960s and 70s inflationary surge ways. Steve, I've been particularly looking forward to talking to you about ESG, environmental, societal and corporate governance, cognizant investing is the theme. Frankly, I don't think on one hand that I've ever heard a more valiant, more legitimate, more more honorable concept than for owners of capital to exercise their social responsibility to be responsible with it. So in principle, I love the idea. And I know as kind of a, a left-leaning political guy, I've got to believe you like it too. But you know what? I think ESG is a scam. I think that most of what's going on is a bunch of Wall Street guys ripping off people who want to be responsible by selling them greenwashed nonsense that has nothing to do with solving climate change and everything to do with separating rich people from their money. Um, that's pretty cynical. You are a guy who follows this climate change stuff pretty darn carefully. Am I right to be that cynical about the way the investment industry has addressed this problem of climate change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm involved with a group called the Biophysical Economics Institute that's trying to bring a bit of realism to ESG and, and to tie it into as well into uh, uh, energy return and energy invested and point out the importance of that. And we, we want to have some validity coming out of the ESG, but fundamentally anything like this is another reason for the wolves of Wall Street to start prowling Main Street. And, and that's how it's being bundled and packaged, just like carbon offsets have, as if, you know, we can fix up climate change by paying an extra 20 bucks on our airfare from uh, New York to London. No, we can't, but it, it works out nicely for the companies marketing those, uh, those offsets. It certainly does. And, you know, it's, it's on a much bigger scale than that. I, I've been reading these stories about people who are buying carbon offsets from people who didn't do anything 
And the people that didn't do anything are polluting in a way that just doesn't happen to be being counted within that particular jurisdiction against them, uh, even though it should be. And, you know, this, this ESG thing, it, it, as far as I can tell, it is really mostly about Wall Street scamming investors into thinking that they're being responsible. The good news is investors want to go to sleep at night feeling like they've been responsible and not just greedy with their money. That's got to be a, an advance for society. Unfortunately, Wall Street is in between those well-meaning investors and actual do-gooding. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think that is going to change. How do we eventually get past this, Steve? Because uh, you and I both, I, I think, agree that climate is super important. We only got one planet. We got to take care of it. But frankly, I don't think that the people that are on the crusades on either side are really dealing with the straight facts. I think this is a very politicized thing. And the e economics of it, I, I think, are making a mess in in. The, the investments that supposedly fix it, I don't think fix it. Are there investments that really do help? Are, are there things without going through ESG funds that investors should be thinking about just how to be responsible investors and do good things with their money? Even on that front, I mean, most investors are buying shares of other investors. You're driving up the price of the share, you're not giving any money to the company involved in whatever whatever um, you know green technology you are allegedly supporting. So I, I to, to me, I think we really need a wake-up call about just how serious climate change is because I don't think it can be done. I don't think it would be handled by a profit-oriented private sector. I think the scale of this is so great that we're going to be forced into going backwards in size, the size of the economy and firms are going to need cash support from a government to be able to stay solvent in the whole process. And the, one of the major reasons why we haven't taken it seriously is economists like William Nordhaus who have completely and utterly distorted the dangers we face with climate change by the shoddiest work I have ever seen. Uh, I published a paper on that in a magazine, a journal called Globalizations last year, and the title of it was The Appallingly Bad Neoclassical Economics of Climate Change. Bottom line is anybody who's taking the numbers that economists have pumped out about what climate change means to the economy are deluding themselves by an order of one or two magnitudes as to how serious climate change is going to be. So all this is here stuff is just more greenwashing. Steve, I'm not going to let you pick on Nordhaus without substantiating your argument. What specifically did Nordhaus get wrong that would cause you to make such a scathing statement on a public podcast? Two, two things in particular, like an overall orientation, which is just believing that climate change can't be bad because capitalism couldn't handle anything. Therefore, climate change can't be too serious. I mean, I'm not joking. That seems to be his, his mental processes. Uh, but in terms of trying to add up what the damages to climate change will be, he assumed that 87% of American economy would be unaffected by climate change because it happens in what he called carefully controlled environments. Now, the industries he said were not going to be affected were all manufacturing, all services, all government activity. He even included overseas GDP uh, as part of you know, the, the trade exposed sectors of the American economy as unaffected by climate change. And that's become a common assumption for all the, all the economists working in this field. Now, that is basically saying that climate is weather. And so if you're not exposed to the weather, you're not exposed to climate change. That is nonsense. That is garbage. The simple reason being, and we can see this with the example of Taiwan right now, one of the examples he gave of a carefully controlled environment was microprocessor manufacturing. Why are we finding the micro remote processes becoming more expensive right now? It's because there's a climate change related drought in Taiwan that means they, the, these enormous factories can't get enough water to do the processing. So the cost of micro shape processes is going through the roof, as well as the disruptions, for the disruptions from COVID. So literally mistaking climate for weather. And doing that in two ways, also arguing, and I've seen one of his fellow travellers on this front, a guy called Richard Toll, make this argument that you can use as, as a proxy for what's going to happen to climate change, you can use the current relationship between income, as a, a gross, let's say gross state product in America, and temperature. So if you look at Maryland, for example, and find that Maryland is 10 degrees colder than Florida and that Florida has got a 20% lower GDP than uh, Maryland, therefore you can say that a 10 degree increase in temperature would reduce the GDP of Maryland by 20%. Now, a 10-degree increase in global temperature would drive the human species extinct, period. 
and, and there's plenty of scientific papers to, to give reasons to believe that. Uh, the simplest one being, for example, that one reason we have the temperate zone where most of the you know, agriculture occurs these days uh, is because there are three circulation systems in each hemisphere. You have what's called the Hadley cell, which is the circulation of air between zero and 30 degrees, uh, from the, you know, the equator to 30 degrees north. You then have 30 to 60 where there's what they call the, the uh, temperate zone and then you have the polar 60 to 90 degrees. If we increase the global temperature by 10 degrees, which is seriously what was considered by one of his acolytes, that according to, is to physicists and atmospheric physicists is twice the level of temperature increase that we be put enough energy into the atmosphere to mean we, we went from three cells to one. It's like turning up the oven, the temperature on your stove on a, on a bowl of soup and you've got these little bubbles, you know, they're, called, they're called Bernoulli cells circulating and you can see them, increase the temperature and the whole thing bubbles and all the Bernoulli structure breaks down. Well, imagine that happening and what happens to Western agriculture. Uh, what it would mean is all the rain would be occurring around the tri- around the equator and around the pole. The pole would be 22 degrees Celsius. In the mean- middle, you'd have pretty much a extremely hot, drought drought stricken part of the planet. You simply can't use those assumptions to make up the data for climate change. And yet that's what they've done to argue, as Nordhaus does, that a six degree increase in temperature on the globe would reduce GDP by 8.1%. Now, that is nonsense, absolute nonsense. And it only got through to be published because economists fundamentally are climate change deniers, most of them, and they don't think you can criticise a theory because of its assumptions, which is crap methodology. So we have got nonsense numbers being used to give corporations um, the apparent guidance that there's only going to be a minor impact from climate change. It's all stuff the economists have made out talking through their asses. Well, I would say that that succinctly addresses my <laughs> request that you clarify why you would make such a critical statement, Steve. Let's move on from there. I got to tell you, I, I really enjoy your perspective on economics, uh, listening to you speak and also reading your books. It's been a few years, though, since I think it was 2017 that you published Can We Avoid Another Financial mm-hmm. Crisis? My Amazon is spying on you. I've got a secret message. Oh, yeah. It says there's a new one. It's called The New Economics, a manifesto by Professor Steve Keen, available for pre-order, but there's no look inside, so I can't see what's in there. It's really saying that neoclassical economics is the phlogiston of uh, the modern era. It's the it's the Ptolemaic astronomy in the time of uh, of moonshots. It's a, a theory which is neat, plausible, and utterly wrong, which shapes how we think about how capitalism functions and is actually making capitalism dysfunctional. So we need a new economics that is not obsessed with equilibrium thinking so we understand complex systems that doesn't pretend that we're a barter economy which have never existed in the first place it's a monetary system where you have to look at money and it's one where energy is absolutely essential to production whereas mainstream economics leaves energy out and it's thinking completely and imagines you can have an economy with no energy input which is total nonsense Uh, and all this has come out of a methodology which ran into all sorts of problems, mathematical problems, where various things that neoclassicals would like to have concluded were proved to be mathematically false. And their answer was, let's make a simplifying assumption and jump over the problem. So, for example, one one of my favourite simplifying assumptions by Paul Samuelson to try to explain how you can take the theory of an individual having a downward sloping individual demand curve to get a market demand sloping demand curve, he literally assumed that America is one big happy family, one big happy family that allocates income before trade so that everybody's happy with the distribution of income before trade goes ahead. Literally. I've got that. That's what I quote in the book. So we have a moribund failed paradigm still dominating how we think, and it's time we got a new one. And what I explain in that book is how you can have a new approach to economics based around complex systems, monetary analysis, and being realistic about the the role of energy in enabling production to occur in the first place. And then, of course, that ties up with climate change as well. So it's it's a pretty heavy read. Mind you, I do use the word bullshit at one point inside the book, so not as heavy as you might think. I can't imagine that coming from you, Steve. Of course not. Uh, Of course not. Well, it is available for pre-order right now on Amazon, so I am clicking as we speak. Steve, before I let you go, I want to bring our listeners up to speed, and frankly, it's a story I don't even understand completely myself. When I first met you, you were a university professor. That means guy gets up in the morning, goes to a university, stands in front of a bunch of people in a room and, and gives a lecture. 
you changed all that. Basically, you were one of the first guys to call the 2008 financial crisis, got kind of famous because of that, got a big following. Now you've kind of basically changed the rules to where you're still a professor of economics, but you don't work for a university. You, you kind of do it freelance. How is that even possible? What's going on? And who are the students? Are we talking about student-aged, you know, kids that want to learn economics from somebody other than a university? Or are we talking about middle-aged people who are investors? Who signs up to say, Steve Keen, I want you to be my, my university-less professor? Good question. It's an interesting combination because it's all through Patreon. So without Patreon, I, I couldn't do what I'm doing now. And I've got about r- roughly 1,500 subscribers on Patreon. And there are people paying everywhere from $1 a month, uh, which is, would mainly be the student end of the spectrum, to $1,000 a month. And if, if I look at the, the, one, the, the $1 end and the students, they're people who want an alternative perspective of what they're getting in the textbooks and what they're getting at university. So that's students getting an alternative education. I actually had a marvellous conversation, by the way, just to mention this, which is on my YouTube channel, where a group of school students got in touch, a brilliantly informed group with a little website called Politics with Nick. And I had a conversation with these, even including a 13-year-old who had his head around Schraffer and all sorts of you know, advanced critiques of mainstream economics that I didn't get my head around until I was in my 20s. Um, so that's that's the, the the student end of things, and I think a lot of the others are people who would like to be doing what I'm doing, but are caught in jobs where they can't. So they're providing me with you know more than or more than they need to give me to enable me to continue doing my work. So like most of the stuff I put up on Patreon, I make freely available, so you don't have to uh, pay my Patreon to read what I'm writing there. And that was with the patron my agreement of my patrons that I do it that way, but. There are some things that I give to people who pay the one dollar and above. Like, for example, I've given a copy of the manuscript of uh, the New Economics to all my subscribers. Uh, then there's a ten dollar a month podcast with a, a great mate of mine and great radio guy Phil Dobby as well. But I've got people paying thirty, a hundred, three hundred, and a thousand dollars. And they're not doing it because they have to. They're doing it because they want to. And my interpretation there is that they would like to be doing what I'm doing. They can't manage to do it themselves because of their own commitments or their own industry. Uh, So helping me do it is their way of of, of, doing one for the team. And I completely and utterly applaud them and thank them for their support because without it I'd be um, you know stuck back at home living on my retirement in- uh, earnings and uh, you know scabbing out what I could manage to do and with this work I can be full-time productive and it's been far far better than being stuck at a university where I've got to answer to bureaucrats all the time. Now, if you want my prediction, the unexpected positive consequence of the COVID crisis is the whole world is going to change with more people like you abandoning the uh, the structures like universities and saying, hey, I can do it all on the Internet and I don't need all of that bureaucracy and all of that nonsense. And I think that makes the world a better place. Steve, we're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. Patrick Serezna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Farmland investing has been a popular macro trend among billionaires and big institutions for the last decade. But the high cost of buying an entire farm puts this asset class out of reach to all but big institutions and the ultra-rich. FarmTogether.com allows any accredited investor to invest in fractional ownership of several different categories of farmland. I recently did an interview with Farm Together founder and CEO Artem Milinchuk. We discussed the macro argument for farmland investing, performance and correlation comparisons to conventional asset classes, and the different types of farmland and their investment characteristics. If you're an accredited investor, I recommend that you listen to that interview to learn why farmland investing just might be a fit for your portfolio. You can find the download link in your research roundup email, or just type the word farmland in the search box on our homepage at macrovoices.com. Check out farmtogether.com today. You'll be glad you did. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Eric, it was great to have uh, Steve back on the show. It's always interesting to hear the different perspectives on how the monetary system works and debt is considered on the balance sheet. What did you take away from the interview? Well, I think Steve is one of the smartest guys. And in fact, I'll say he's the smartest guy I know of 
whose views I respect, despite the fact that he is very much on the, the opposite side of an ideological belief system about the role of government in managing money systems and so forth. So I really wanted to hear that view. And I think that um, the MMT crowd is definitely coming into power. And I think it's going to be very interesting. The inflation will be good for markets and feel good to the economy in the beginning. No question about that. It's a few years into it that it starts to get scary. In any event, Patrick, I want to move on to our post-game chart book, which is titled Looking at Bonds and Yields. What's going on here on page two as we look at the S&P 500? That's not bonds and yields. (laughs) <laughs> well, just wanted to do a quick update going into next week on the S&P 500. I mean, we have uh, the big quarterly uh, quad witching OPEX roll off coming up next week. And like we've heard from Charlie McElligot many times when he's been on the show, this is a period where there's uh, uh, tends to be a lot of gamma pinning uh, by dealers. And it's you can really see how the daily ranges have completely tightened up on the S&P. And barring some big catalyst, it's probably going to be a little bit more of the same going into next week's uh, option expiration. And so it'll be interesting to see, but this level right in this zone, uh, 4,200 to 4,250 is going to be an area that uh, the market is uh, likely to bounce around within in the coming week. Nonetheless, I wanted to go and actually talk about these bond yields because obviously Steve was uh, gave us a great interview and had the perspective that he didn't think yields were going to go too much higher than where they currently were. And I thought it was really interesting because some people in the past have made uh, the correlation that higher inflation typically would uh, manifest with higher nominal yields. But really, we've seen that ever since these high inflation numbers, including the one that came out earlier, another monthly, month over month high print on the CPI, and the bonds don't seem to be reacting to it. In fact, they uh, are outright breaking down. And uh, it's interesting. It looks like uh, some sort of a bond bottom may very well be in. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how low yields go in this impulse. Patrick, we've got the 210 spread on page four, and it looks to me like the same kind of breakdown. Well, really, uh, we've seen the um, the bear steepening and the bull flattener uh, really kicking in. Obviously, the front of the curve is pinned by the, the Fed. And so really, this is uh, now just a mirror image of of the 10-year nominal yield as, uh, as we're moving. And so it's interesting that the steepener trade, which has worked so well for almost um, a year going into March, has really now seemed to have run out of upside momentum and continues to be reversing very much in line with that 10-year yield. Well, Patrick, we're looking almost at the same chart upside down on page five, aren't we? Well, this is exactly it. And so I wanted to just flip it over and and really ask that question. I mean, most people have been generally avoiding the long bond. And obviously, with the risk that we could have much higher yields, and there was the fear that we were going to go well north of 2% on the 10-year yield. And that's kept most people sidelined on this bond. But now, uh, after seeing several months of consolidation, we're uh, seeing an attempt for the the long bond, in this this case, the TLT chart that we're showing here for the 20-plus your treasury bonds really reversing up and and ask the question as to whether or not we're going to see a little bit of a bond rally. Nonetheless, um, that breakout has also happened, if you look on page six, on uh, corporate bonds. And so we we saw the lows uh, on investment grade corporate bonds on the using the LQD happen in March. And uh, we're really seeing uh, an attempt to break out on the upside. It, it looks like at this stage, these corporate bonds could easily head up towards the 135 level and test all of those September, October, November consolidation lows in this push. Patrick, I'm tentatively starting to come around to the view that the scare that we saw in Treasury yields was just that, a scare that it's over, that it's behind us. And we really are going to find out, just as I expected, that the reasons that all of the spending that the Biden administration wants to do might have caused yields to move higher are going to be offset by policy actions to keep them lower. And that's what we predicted here on Macro Voices months ago, and that's exactly what seems to be happening now. Patrick, let's take a look at the triple Bs. That's the high-grade credit spreads. 
normally we would always show the junk bond credit spread. Just wanted to really touch on both uh, of them, including the, the investment grade and the junk. We continue to see multi-year lows in terms of the, those credit spreads. Now, there, there's by part, it's a function of the fact that interest rates are so low that it's very easy for the spreads to be more narrow. So I don't want to overread too much into that alone. But we have entered a real period where there's a lot of complacency towards the credit risks associated with corporate bonds versus that of U.S. Treasuries. And so it will be it's interesting to watch and see whether or not at some point something uh, spooks the market and actually forces the market to start pricing in some additional risks in these uh, credit spreads. It's worth noting that the bond market has really calmed down in general. And a lot of that fearful selling that we really saw taking place since November through March, uh, really everything has calmed down and, and the entire bond market has really started to, uh, to turn up a little bit. And it'll be interesting to see how long that lasts. And folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, be sure to check out a free 14-day trial of Big Picture Trading. You can find the information on page 8 or at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to keep it tight this week and leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by farmtogether.com, making farmland investing a trillion-dollar asset class available to all accredited investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the chart book we just discussed in the post game. There's also a link to a great interview with options positioning godfather, Jem Carson, as well as a link to the Jeffrey Snyder article titled The Inflation Emotions. Uh, so you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, Follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric, spelt with a K. And myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC.
For more information, visit macrovoices.com.